Hello, everyone. The time is now 1.10 p.m. Eastern time, and we're about to get started. Um, welcome, as always. Please feel free to engage in conversation with other participants in the chat window in Whova. Uh, if you have questions, please enter them in the Whova Q&A window. Uh, the presenter will address them during the will either address them during the presentation or live after the video, if time allows, um, by putting your questions in the Q&A window. Um, that will help me also facilitate. So um, this question will be recorded and will be available at a later date on the Code for Lib YouTube channel. Uh, before we get started, as we're stretched across North America and many are joining us from across the world, we respectfully respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral lands of indigenous, Native American and First Nation peoples. Land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities. Solidarity can look like donating time and money to indigenous led organizations, amplifying voices of indigenous people, leading grassroots change movements and returning land. Uh, as sponsorship chair uh, for Code for Lib this year, I also would like to do a special thank you to Jenna Avon and Brian Mass for their work on the sponsorship committee, which helped to make Code for Lib possible. So um, as we get started, we are ready for our first presentation. Um, our first presentation is, it's all about perspective, rethinking how we work with an API first mindset. Um, and this will be presented by uh, Hank Sway and Clara Turp. Uh, Hank is the product manager for APIs and Easy Proxy at OCLC, and Clara is the discovery systems librarian at McGill University. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here and welcome to our talk that is called It's All About Perspective, Rethinking the Way We Work with an API First Mindset. So I'm here presenting with Hank. I'm Clara Turp. I'm discovery systems librarian at McGill University. And I'm Hank Sway. I'm the product manager for Easy Proxy and APIs at OCLC. So our agenda today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an API first mindset. Um, and Clara's going to explain some more about how an API can solve multiple problems. Uh, we'll then both cover uh, when to use or build an API respectively. And then Clara will wrap things up with why APIs matter going forward. Um, so the API first mindset, um, just want to set a little bit of context first. So an API stands for application programming interface. Um, and you know what APIs are all about is really facilitating data exchange um, and synchronizing workflows across multiple systems. And that can either be a single direction or it can be a bi-directional exchange. And you know, when we think about the old way, quote, quote, of building technology products, we really think mainly about the end user of a specific UI product, um, which is great uh, to be thinking about the user, but it does kind of restrict your technology to being just about that specific user interface. Um, so what we're suggesting is the new way is to think about APIs first. So thinking API first will allow you to solve more problems across different devices and multiple systems. Um, it will allow you to create new workflows, enhance existing workflows, as well as reduce redundant or duplicative work across multiple systems and ensure consistency behind them. Um, so with that, I'll just hand it back to Clara um, to give some further examples of that. So we're gonna talk a bit about how APIs can solve many problems and specifically how are APIs used by McGill and how do we build solutions with APIs? So I've built this with three different general categories of projects. So the first one is we use APIs for bulk projects. By that, I mean a one-time project that usually affects many, many records or many patrons. Some example of that would be cleaning metadata or adding data to LHRs or an example I gave in another Code for Lib presentation, uh, adding notes automatically. So the second category is building tools. So I have this dream about building a toolkit for WorldShare for things that are often 
asked or expected or done by staff that are a little painful. Uh, so for example, would one example would be uh, with a CSV file returning all barcodes based on OCLC numbers with shelving locations, for example. Uh, another example would be based on titles, returning every knowledge base collection the title is found in. That's the knowledge base is our way to manage electronic resources and we group all titles in a knowledge base. So joining in those collections, sorry, in knowledge base collections. So seeing which collections have which titles and if a title is found in multiple collections is a task that can help us improve our knowledge base over time. And the last example would be bulk extending patron expiry dates uh, so that when they all happen at the same time, it doesn't have to be a manual painful process for staff. And the last category is for systems connectivity. So any way that we link WorldShare to any peripheral system. Uh, so a couple examples of this is we link it with our institutional repository. So by sending the metadata back and forth from one system to the other, we allow the metadata to be consistent and improve discovery. We also link WorldShare with our institutional financial system for acquisitions. And finally, we, we're planning on having offsite storage. And with that, we need to link the storage to WorldShare so our system is representative of the reality of the item. Is it available? Is it not available? Is it in transit? It needs to appear in both systems in real time. So we use APIs for that as well. And now I will share, uh, pass it on to Hank for uh, the next section. Great. Yeah. So I'm just going to cover real briefly some different ways that OCLC uses APIs. So, you know, like Claire was saying, we often use them to synchronize data across systems. So, you know, the acquisitions example that Claire gave is a great one. You know, we use that to import data um, when we are onboarding a new library onto WorldShare Management Services. And then we can also continue to use the APIs going forward to assure their financial data is synced between WMS and their campus financial system. Uh, a second example is, you know, creating a consistent experience across applications and devices. Um, so, you know, this could be searching in your uh, web application library catalog versus a mobile app. Um, we also do this within our staff facing mobile app called Digby. Um, so, you know, one of the main um, student worker workflows in Digby is around circulation pull lists. Um, so when a student pulls up the pull list in Digby, it's going to be the same that you would see in the web application, WMS, and so on. And finally, APIs can also, you know, we use them to help libraries extend their footprint beyond the sort of traditional library space. Um, so this could be through partner integrations into learning management systems or student portal systems. Um, it could also be, you know, kind of into the main footprint of the web as well. Um, so, you know, we think that's another really exciting application of APIs. Um, so in our next section, um, Claire is going to talk a little bit about when to use APIs and then I'll uh, come back and talk about when we build them. Perfect. So when do you use an API? What is the questions you want to ask yourself before building a script using an API? I really think of APIs as tools and it's one amongst many tools you can use to find a solution. So the question is, when does it make more sense to use this tool? So I found four questions that eventually you kind of ask yourself unconsciously. Uh, but the first one would be how many things are affected? Is it affecting uh, 100 items or 100,000 items? And of course, the more items or patrons or things you have, the more it makes sense to build a solution using an API. The second one would be how often would the problem rise? If it affects 150 patrons, but it happens every month, then it might make sense to invest time in building an automated solution that will save time on the long term. So maybe the first time you run the script, it won't save you much time, but then going forward, you'll just keep improving your workflows. The third one is how difficult is the manual workaround? There's always another way to do something. Uh, some manual workflows are pretty easy, straightforward, doesn't cause too much pain to staff. Some, some workflows are a bit 
more pain points for specific staff. So the more painful or difficult the workaround is, the more I tend to invest time in a programmatic solution. And then the last one is, is there another tool that could be used? Is there another tool that's offered by the system or mark edit or any kind of tool that exists that could some cause it, find a solution in a quicker way? If there's no other tool, then usually an API makes sense. So I've kind of grouped those questions into three general category of when do I use an API? So redundancy, the more redundant, the more I tend to build an API. Difficult workarounds, I really like rethinking workflows and simplifying work for other staff members of the library. So anytime something causes pain points, I think it's time, it's worth investing time to find a solution and see if APIs might be a solution for that problem. And then if there's many things, the more you talk about large scale projects, the more APIs usually make sense to use. And Hank will talk a little bit about when to build an API. Yeah, um, so we're currently working on a new uh, discovery API. And um, I just wanted to share some of the questions we've been asking ourselves um, as we've been developing it. So, you know, we know we want this API to support, you know, powering a discovery layer. Um, but, you know, that central question there, what are the use cases beyond that? You know, how can a discovery API support cataloging workflows or shared print or stacks management and so on? You know, we really think that, you know, considering, you know, an API is not just a one trick pony is a really important thing to do. Um, and like Claire was saying, you know, how can it prevent redundant work across, you know, different departments in the library and across different systems? And then again, you know, how can it come back and extend the library's reach into search engines, into campus platforms, uh, into research information management systems, you know, other places where the library, you know, wants to get increased visibility. So this discovery API lives on our new API platform. Um, and one of the advantages of this platform is that our APIs can now share code and components much more easily. Um, so you know our discovery API will share exist will share existing code and components uh, with the WorldCat search API, with the WorldCat metadata API. And this is great because it assures a more consistent experience across these APIs, but it also you know, reduces the amount of development work we need to do to produce a new API, meaning we can get new uh, services out to market faster, which of course everybody also likes. And as we were developing our new API platform, we really thought of it in terms of building blocks. And these building blocks create a further level of uh, consistency for the user as well. So for example, you're going to authenticate and authorize the same way to use each of these APIs. Um, they're going to all be serialized in JSON format. Um, the way the APIs do faceting and pagination and relevancy is all going to be similar. Um, so we want to you know, really create a better developer experience using the APIs as well as a better user experience for the folks using your applications. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Clara to wrap us up. So to finish, why do APIs matter? Why do we bother uh, building them, using them? Why are we presenting this to you today? So we think that APIs really add value. They add institutional value uh, because you can provide more services, you can simplify workflow, you can make life easier for staff members, you can do a lot of things that just allow everyone to have a better experience. Um, I just want to add a note that with great power comes great responsibility. And I really think it's important to say that if you can bulk update 100,000 LHRs, you can also bulk delete them. And that is a bit of a scary thing. So I think it's good to think about that also when you embark on an API journey to say it in a cheesy way and make sure that you cover your grounds and you find institutional best practices. And finally, honestly, I think it's fun. Uh, I think I'm in a crowd that would agree with me that we're always looking for ways to code and to improve our skills and API is a really good way to do that. And it's really fun to discover new 
workflows and you to think creatively and think a bit outside the box of how can you improve uh, life of your staff and services you offer to users. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. And uh, we are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so we have Hank and Clara here. Um, Hank and Clara, I know that there's uh, two remaining questions within the Q&A that wasn't answered uh, by text. Um, uh, specifically, someone asked, uh, do you also provide open APIs which can be used by anyone or are APIs limited to internal use? Um, so I was just typing out an answer, but it's probably faster for me to speak to it. So, um, so the APIs we're talking about today are available to OCLC member libraries. Uh, so, you know, depending on which API you're talking about, some require subscriptions to certain OCLC services. So it kind of depends which service you're talking about. Um, we do also have some APIs that are completely open um, without any form of authentication or subscription required as well. Thank you. Um, uh, there was a, a question from Aiden Sawyer. Have you done much work in investigating when slash how APIs should interact, particularly with regard to an API gateway of some sort? Yes, yes. So um, one of, you know, we didn't really do a deep dive on this in this particular presentation, but our um, new API platform, which we completed in early 2020, um, it uses a, a cloud-based API gateway. Um, so one of the, you know, advantage of that that we've started to look at is, you know, that will allow us to, you know, re as I sort of said in the presentation, that allows us to reuse some of the API components, <clears throat> excuse me, across different services. Um, so that's really been very cool to explore. Um, and I think it will help promote, you know, different consistency across the APIs and lots of new advantages. So if there's any, you know, follow up questions there, I'm happy to speak to those too. So Awesome. Um, there is a specific question for you, Hank. <laughs> Uh, concerning if there's any plans to improve current documentation, especially search and metadata API. Uh, there are still annoying issues and inaccuracies there. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably something we need to look at more specifically, but um, in case uh, it sounds like this, the person who's asking this question already is aware of this, but um, we did move our API documentation to a new platform um, around the same time that we launched the new API infrastructure as well. Um, so we are now using the open API specification to document our, our APIs. Um, so just in case you hadn't seen that, you know, check, uh, go to um, developer.api.oclc.org um, and you can get those improvements. But if you do have um, some, you know, other um, issues with the docs, um, then we're happy to get those sorted out too. So. Um, there's another question uh, uh, from Matthew Lincoln for AP uh, for APIs for things like bibliographic records that already have some shared metadata standards. When do you try to make the API match those shared models versus sticking to the most direct representation of your implementation system? That, that's a, a very um, ponderous question. <laughs> I think I might need to uh, consider that. I don't know, and I can't, um, I don't know, Clara, do you have any thoughts on how you've implemented this or um, from, from that perspective? So. Uh, not really. Um, I'm not fully sure I totally understand the question either. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I may be struggling. Kind of, I was just going to reread the question. I may be struggling with that a little bit too. So, I believe it's at what point? Sorry, everyone's having great questions that are coming in. Uh, basic, uh, basically, at what uh, when you have 
bibliographic records with already some shared metadata standards, at what point do you try to make the API match those shared uh, metadata, uh, shared metadata standard models versus sticking to the most direct representation in your implementation system? I think it's more on your side, Hank, because it would be more, because basically I'm kind of stuck with whatever the, because the, the API usually, when it returns my bibliographic format in a very specific format and I have to stick to that. Uh, but it's usually, uh, for a metadata standpoint, uh, I tend to try to stick the most closely to whatever standard we have. And I rarely write, you write code with bib records without talking to a cataloger that goes through uh, yeah. lengthy conversations. Um, but I think maybe, um, there would be ways to kind of not necessarily respect fully everything about standards, but I wouldn't call that a good practice. I'm not sure I'm answering. Yeah, I mean, so one example that's coming to mind, um, is kind of comparing our, our WorldCat search API versus the WorldCat metadata API. So the WorldCat metadata API is a very cataloging focused API. Um, so you can use that API to get Mark XML format records directly. So it's like directly following that standard for Mark bibliographic data. If you go over to the WorldCat search API, at least version two of the search API and our future discovery API, those uh, transform that mark data into a JSON serialization, um, which we really think is a more useful format. Um, and we hear from the community, it's a more useful format in terms of uh, use cases like integrating with discovery layers. Um, so that's kind of when we start to look at transforming that data and um, you know, making it available in different use cases. And I see a, a chat from Jen that our time is up. Yes, so, your time's um, up, yes. Um, that. So thank uh, you everyone. There's two more Q and A's, but I know Hank and Clara will be following up uh, with written answers. So um, thank you so much, Hank and Clara for uh, your presentation. Uh, what I do wanna say is we'll be staying in this virtual meeting room for the next talk, but be sure to transition to the next session in Whova like go to the next talk in Whova uh, to, in order to participate in the correct chat polling Q&A for the next session. Uh, if you're joining in Whova, you will need to reselect join in Whova in the next session listing. Um, so coming up next, uh, this uh, session will be recorded and available at a later date on the Code for Lib YouTube channel. Our next presentation is a serverless journey, how we develop reliable, resilient, and scalable library services. And this will be presented um, by Ian Lin Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen is a digital library architect and assistant professor at the Virginia Tech Libraries in Blacksburg, Virginia. He holds a PhD in computer science and applications from Virginia Tech. Uh, he leads a team at the University Libraries bu building reliable, resilient, and scalable library services in the cloud environment, AWS. Hi, everyone. My name is Yi Ding Chen. I'm digital library I take at the Virginia Tech Library. Today, I will present how we build libraries using serverless. In this presentation, I will tell you what is serverless why we use serverless and how we build library application using serverless. In the past, we used three layers architecture to build our library service. So everything is bundled together. We change one thing, we deploy a whole stack. But when the business is more complicated or we want to change a tiny features, this become a burden because everything is bundled together. So we move from this kind of architecture into serverless architectures. Once we move into the serverless architectures, we can have multiple different kinds of user interface. Also, we can support API interface to connect to other server. Underline the user interface, our basic logic layer is 
a lot of different kinds of microservice and also management service. So each service do one job and do that job very well. And they are communicated with each other to finish one business goal or multiple business goals. Also, we, now we can choose multiple purpose view database based on our business need. Not in the past, we can only like choose one like relational database to do everything. We can choose different kinds of database to do many things. So query serverless. Serverless is very simple. So like in the past, you need to create a server, right? Then you deploy your applications. We still deploy your application in the servers, but we don't need to create a service by that server by ourselves. The server is created by the cloud provider. In our case, we use AWS to create that server for us, to management that server for us. We don't want to spend time on managing the servers. We just like want to create a new service on top of the server. There are four different kinds of architecture we can use serverless. So I will present each. So the main, main reason we go serverless because we don't want to spend the time on the maintenance, the servers, like upgrade uh, Ubuntu from 18 to 20 or do the security patch. We, want to, we don't want to spend time on that. We want to deliver our new service more quickly. We want to re reduce our time to implement new features. We want to provide everything is automatic and uh, scalable and scalable, scalable by using cloud providers. So we can lower operational and uh, development cost and we don't want to pay for idle. Once we move everything in the cloud, we can use DevOps. So everything is automatic. I can monitor everything in the cloud using the tools they provide. Everything is configurable. We can monitor, reduce the, our software development life cycles because everything is automatic. It becomes very fast. We shorten our software deployment times a lot. So first is a microservice architectures. So right now a server, a service, a new service is connected by underlying this service is a lot of different small service. And the each service, we can use any kind of programming language we want. And the, these service, these microservice are communicated to each other to finish one business goal. So each server, because they do one job and do one job very well, and uh, they can, because they are decoupled, so we can switch the service or we can update the service just by that server, that service very quickly. So we can continue enhance our server just by request underlying little microservice. This is the example we built using the implement the microservice application and the create our library service. So you can see in here, so this is the FIST check service. Under this service, we implement different microservices in here. So each Lambda function, a microservice, do one job and do that job very well. For example, this one like the trivial fire, this one is computer checksum, and the third one is validate checksum. So we just focus on implement this microservice and connect to each others and our service is there and everything is deployed in the cloud. Another is cloud native architectures. So this architecture we build it, we deploy our application in the cloud using the, the service tool 
money the tools, automation tools provided by, by the cloud and apply to a filter methodology. So everything is automatic. And once we set up a deployment configurations, we set up once we have this pipeline, we can have new feature, new service using this pipeline to deploy very quickly. And we don't need to handle about how to deploy it, how to create a server, how to uh, configure a network. We just use it. So under the cloud native architectures, so how we see the AWS service, we just like Lego brick. We have business, business uh, logic or business goal we want to achieve, we want to complete. We just pick and choose the AWS service and connect to each others and then write some uh, microservice to communicate. Then our new, a new library service is up. So this is another example. So deploy this kind of look like complicated architecture. Actually, it's very simple. We just, we still, uh, need to write a template. And uh, this template is more straightforward. We just, we just simply tell AWS what kind of server service we want to use, how they communicate into each others. And set up once, we can deploy multiple. Okay, so for this is a simple We Every time we have this set up, we can have one click button deploy to deploy this kind of service in the cloud very quickly. Also, we want to have everything automatic. So we use event-driven service architectures. So everything is automatic. So like we can supply a task. And uh, once the server receive a task, they will trigger. So like in, under this architecture, they have event producer, event router, and the event consumer. Producer receive the task and the dispatch the task to the routers. Router then based on the what kind of task and uh, move these tests to consumers, the consumer process the task. So everything is triggered by event and uh, do everything automatically. So this is another example we built in the cloud to process Triple IF image. So once we set up these infrastructures, everything is tri event triggered. We have a test fire upload to S3, trigger this event, fire upload. Then this event, okay, a new file is received. Tier one microservice, and uh, they will create multiple jobs to handle, to create a triple IF image then we can get our result. Next one is cloud-based artificials. So we use the serverless cloud-based applications. So everything is deployed in the cloud. We let AWS to handle the networking, the CDN to host our code. We just focus on implements, our new features, our new website, and everything underlying is using AWS service. So we use AWS Amplify Framework, it's an open source framework to deploy um, our website. We, we use React on top of Amplify Framework and using Amplify Framework to connect all, all the backend different AWS service. To the APB sync, we can connect to multiple other microservices or data search or database or other third party applications. And everything is automatic. So once we commit our code, we let AWS to create a server, compile our code, do an integration test, deploy our code and the verify. Everything is automatic. So you can see the times very quickly in the past. I think it may be not enough to just like create a server. Also, we support open source. So we implement 
uh, GitHub Actions. So connect GitHub repository with AWS. So we can able to have this like every single pull request, we can have an environment, we have, can have the site, every single pull request. So it's, it's, it is impossible to do in the past, but we can do it right now. So, um, so after we uh, move our artificial into a service, so we can easily to use the agile methodology to create a new library service. And we focus on implement new, new service. We don't need to worry about how to config or how to uh, resolve the software, software dependence in order to have a server, we just use the servers. So we write less code and uh, we can de deliver new service more quickly than before. All our, our service is open source. Feel free to check this out. So this is a site and uh, we have many service all implement using serverless architectures. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Elon. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Elon has answered all the questions on uh, the Q&A session. Uh, so with that, if you do have more questions, please put in the Q&A. Our fantastic speaker will answer them uh, via text, by a textual way. Um, but we are at time, so uh, fortunately, I have to move. We have to move on to the next presenter. Uh, so again, we're going to be staying in this virtual meeting room. Um, please transition to the next session in Whova uh, to participate in Q and A and chat and polling. Uh, again, if you're joining in Whova, you'll need to reselect "Join in Whova" in the next session listing. Um, and if you're lost, if you've been like. If you're two or three sessions behind or whatever, you can always go to the agenda tab and then be able to uh, select the correct uh, talk um, to, uh, to have your Q&A and chat. Okay, so our next talk will be Code That Lasts, uh, Sustainable and Usable Open Source Code. Uh, and our presenter for this presentation is uh, Jonathan Rockkind. Jonathan works at the Science History Institute. Hi, I'm Jonathan Rockkind, and this is Code That Lasts, Sustainable and Usable Open Source Code. So who am I? I've been developing open source library software since 2006, mainly in Ruby and Rails. Over that time, I participated in a variety of open source projects meant to be used by multiple institutions. And I've often seen us having challenges with long-term maintenance, sustainability, and usability of our software. This includes in projects I've been instrumental in creating myself. We, we've all been there. We're used to thinking of this problem in terms of needing more maintainers. But first, let's think more about what the situation looks like before we assume what causes it. In addition to features or changes people want not getting done, it can also look like, for instance, being stuck using out-of-date dependencies like old, even end-of-life versions of Rails or Ruby, or a reduction in software polish over time. What do I mean by polish? Engineer Richard Schneeman writes, quote, when we say something is polished, it means that it is free from sharp edges, even the small ones. I view polished software to be ones that are mostly free from frustration. They do what you expect them to and are consistent. Back to me, I've noticed that software can start out very well polished, but over time lose that polish as it's uh, developed. This usually goes along with decreasing cohesion in software over time, a feeling like the different parts of the software start to no longer tell the developer a consistent story together. So while there can be an element of truth in needing more maintainers in some cases, zero maintainers is obviously too few. There are also ways that increasing the number of committers or maintainers can result in diminishing returns and additional challenges. One of the theses of Fred Brooks' famous 1975 book, The Mythical Man Month, is sometimes called Brooks' Law. Quote, 
under certain conditions, an incremental person, when added to a project, makes the project take more time, not less time. End quote. Why? One of the main reasons Brooks discusses is that the additional time taken for communication and coordination between more people. With every person you add, the number of connections between people goes up combinatorially. That may partially explain the phenomenon we sometimes see with so-called design by committee, where too many cooks in the kitchen can produce inconsistency or excessive complexity. Cohesion and polish require a unified design vision. That's not incompatible with increasing the number of maintainers, but it does make it more challenging because it takes more time to get everyone on the same page and to iterate while maintaining a unifying vision. There's also more we could say about the difference between just a bunch of committers committing PRs and the maintainer's role of maintaining historical context and design vision for how, how all the parts fit together. So instead of assuming adding more committers or maintainers is always the solution, can there instead be ways to reduce the amount of maintenance required? I started thinking about this a little bit when I noticed a couple of projects of mine which had become more widely successful than I had any right to expect, considering how little maintenance was being put into them. One of these is Bento Search, which is a toolkit for searching different external search engines in a consistent way. Bento Search is especially but not exclusively used for displaying multiple search results in a Bento box style, which is what Tito Sierra from NCSU first called these little side-by-side -side search results from different search engines. I wrote Bento Search for use at a former job in 2012. 55% uh, of all the commits to the project were made in 2012. Uh, yeah, I gave it a little bit more attention for a contracting project in 2016, and 95% of all commits to Bento Search were made in 2016 or earlier. Bento Search has never gotten a lot of maintenance. I don't use it anymore myself at work. It's not in wide use, but I found it kind of amazing when I saw people giving me credit in conference presentations for the gem that they were using in the apps they were showing, which, thank you, I appreciate that, uh, when I didn't even know they were using it, and I hadn't been paying any attention to the gem at all. It's still used by a handful of institutions for whom it just keeps working with little attention from maintainers. Uh, the screenshot in this slide is from Cornell University Libraries. Another project is Traject, a Mark to Solar indexing tool written in Ruby. It's also more generally an extract transform load tool. And I wrote it with Bill Duber from the University of Michigan in 2013. We hoped it would catch on in the Blacklight community, but for the first couple years, its uptake was pretty slow. However, since then, it's come to be pretty popular in Blacklight and Samvera communities and a few other library technology uses, especially with solar. Uh, you can see this in this commit graph at the top of the slide, you can see the spikes of commit activity in the graph for a 2.0 release in 2015 and a 3.0 release in 2018. But for the most part, at other times, nobody's really been spending much time on maintaining Traject. Every once in a while, a community member submits a minor pull request it's usually me who reviews it. Me and Bill maintain the only. Me and Bill remain the only maintainers. But Traject just keeps plugging along. It is picking up adoption. It's working well for adopters. It keeps working. Uh, so this made me start thinking. Based on what I've seen in my career, what are some of the things that might make open source projects both low maintenance and successful in their adoption and ease of use for developers and well liked by developers, uh, finding them so-called polished. So one thing both of these projects did was take backwards compatibility very seriously. The first step there is following semantic versioning, a set of rules whose main point is that releases can't include backwards and compatible changes unless they are a new major version, like going from 1.x to 2.0. <clears throat> this is important but it's not alone enough to minimize backwards and compatible changes that add maintenance burden to the ecosystem. If the real goal is preventing the pain of backwards and compatibility, we also need to limit the number of major version releases and limit within the major version release uh, the number and scope of backwards breaking changes. We really need to limit backwards breaking changes, not just tie them to major releases. Uh, the Bento search gem has only had one major release. It's never had a 2.0 release and is still backwards compatible to its initial release. Traject is on a 3.x release after eight years, but the major releases of Traject have had extremely few backwards breaking changes. Most people could upgrade through major versions, changing very little or most often nothing in their projects. 
So, okay, sure. Everyone wants to minimize backwards compatibility. It sounds nice. It's easy to say, but how do you do it? Well, it helps to have less code overall and have that code change less often overall. But again, great. How, how do you do that? So parsimony is a word in just general English that means the quality of economy or frugality in the use of resources. In terms of software architecture, it means having as few as possible moving parts inside your code. Fewer classes, types, components, entities, whatever. Most fundamentally, I like to think of it in terms of minimizing the concepts in the mental model a programmer needs to grasp how the code works and what parts do what. I think the goal of software architecture design is what's the smallest possible architecture we can create to make, quote, simple things simple and complex things possible, as computer scientist Alan Kay once described the goal of software design. So we can see this in Bento Search. It has very few internal architectural concepts. The main thing Bento Search does is provide a standard API for querying a search engine and representing results of that search. Uh, Bento Search makes these consistent across different search engines with a common metadata vocabulary for what results look like. This makes search engines interchangeable to calling code. And Bento Search also includes half a dozen or so search engine implementations for services I needed or wanted to evaluate when I wrote it. So that part of Bento Search can be used all by itself, even without the next part, which gives Bento Search its name, the actual Bento style searching. Uh, some built-in support for displaying search engine results in boxes on a page of your choice in a Rails app while writing very little boilerplate code. Traject has an architecture which is basically just three parts at the top level. There's a reader which sends objects into the pipeline. There are some indexing rules which are transformation steps from a source object to build a output hash. And then a writer which takes the output hash and turns it to write to some store, such as Solar. The reader, the transformation steps, and the writer are all independent and really don't care about each other and can be mixed and matched. That's pretty much Traject's architecture. That's most of it right there. It seems simple and obvious once you have it, but it can take a lot of work to end up with what's simple and obvious in retrospect. When designing software, I'm often reminded of the apocryphal quote, I would have written a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. And also about Traject, to be fair, there is a lot of complexity within that indexing rule step, but the design of it was approached the same way. We had use cases about supporting configuration settings from a file or a command line, or a use case about allowing reusable custom transformation logic. And I, me and Bill had to figure out what's the simplest possible architecture we can come up with to support those use cases. So, Again, that sounds nice, but how do you do it? I don't have a paint by numbers, but I can say that for both these projects, I took some time, a few weeks or even months at the beginning, to work out the architectures. Lots of diagramming, some prototyping I was where I was prepared, uh, some prototyping I was prepared to throw out, and in some cases, documentation-driven design, where I wrote some docs for code I hadn't even written yet to see to see how it felt. Uh, for Traject, it was invaluable to have Bill Duber at the University of Michigan also collaborating and uh, interested in this plan of spending some design time up front, bouncing ideas back and forth with each other, uh, to actually intentionally go through an architectural design phase before the implementation. Figuring out a good parsimonious architecture takes some domain knowledge. What things your industry, that is other potential adopters, are going to want to do in this area? and specifically what developers are going to want to do with your tool. We're maybe used to thinking of use cases in terms of end users, but it can be useful at the architectural design stage to formalize developer use cases. What is a developer going to want to do? How can I come up with the smallest number of software pieces she can use to assemble together to do those things? When we said make simple things simple and complex things possible, we can maybe say that domain analysis and use cases is identifying what things we're going to consider those simple things and complex things or leave out entirely. For Bento search, for instance, the simple thing we want to make simple is just do a keyword search in a search engine and display results without the calling code needing to know anything about the specifics of that search engine specifically. 
Uh, another way to get a head start on solid domain knowledge is to start with another tool you have experience with that you want to create a replacement for. Before Traject, I and other users used a tool written in Java called SolarMark to do our solar indexing. I knew how we had used it and where we had hit roadblocks or things we found harder or more complicated than we'd like, so I knew that my goals in Traject were to make exactly those things simpler. So, you know, that was a rewrite, essentially, a rewrite of SolarMark in Traject. We're used to hearing arguments about avoiding rewrites, but like most things in software engineering, there can be pitfalls on either extreme. I was amused to notice that Fred Brooks, in the previously mentioned Mythical Man Month, makes some arguments in both directions. Brooks famously warns about a second system effect, the quote, tendency of small, elegant, and successful systems to be succeeded by over-engineered, bloated systems due to inflated expectations and overconfidence. So that's a reason to be cautious of a, re of a rewrite. But Brooks, in the very same book, also writes, quote, in most projects, the first system built is barely usable. Hence, plan to throw one away. You will anyhow. So, you know, it's up to us to figure out when we're in which case. I personally think an application is more likely to be bitten by the second system effect, danger of a rewrite, while a shared reusable library is more likely to benefit from a rewrite, in part because a reusable library is harder to change in place without disruption. So we could sum up a lot of different principles here as variations of keep it small. Both Traject and Bento Search are tools that developers can use to build something. Developers can use. Bento Search just puts search results in a box on a page. The developer is responsible for the page and an overall app. So this means you have to be a Ruby developer to use it. You have to develop the app yourself. This is a tool for that. That might limit his audience, but I've noticed that often open source attempts at shrink-wrapped solutions that you don't need to be a developer to use end up still needing developer expertise to successfully deploy. Keeping our tools simple and small and not trying to supply a complete app can actually leave more time for these developers to focus on meeting local needs instead of fighting with a complicated framework that doesn't do quite what they need. It also means we can limit interactions with any external dependencies. Traject was developed for use with a Blacklight project, but Traject code doesn't refer to Blacklight or even Rails at all, which means new releases of Blacklight or Rails can't possibly break Traject. Bento Search, by doing one thing and not caring about the details of its host application, has kept working from Rails 3.2 all the way up to current Rails 6.1 with pretty much no changes needed except to the test, test suite setup for Bento Search. Sometimes when people try to have lots of small tools working together, it can turn into a nightmare where you get a pile of cascading software breakages every time one piece changes. Keeping the assumptions and couplings down is what lets us avoid that maintenance nightmare. Another way of keeping it small is don't be afraid to say no to features when you can't figure out how to fit them in without serious harm to the parsimony of your architecture. Your domain knowledge is what lets you make an educated guess as to what features are core to your audience and need to be accommodated, and which are edge cases and can be fulfilled by extension points, or sometimes not at all. So by extension points, <clears throat> we mean we prefer opportunities for developer users to write their own code, which works with your tools, rather than trying to build less commonly needed features in as configuration options in your tool. As an example, Traject does include some built-in logic, but one of its extension point use cases is making sure it's simple to add whatever transformation logic a developer user wants and have it look just as built-in as what came with Traject. And since Traject makes it easy to write your own reader or writer, its built-in readers and writers don't need to include every possible feature someone might want. We plan for developers to just write their own if they need something else. Looking at Bento Search, it makes it easy to write your own search engine adapter that will be used interchangeably with the built-in ones. Also, Bento Search provides a standard way to add custom search arguments specific to a particular adapter. Uh, these won't be directly interchangeable with other adapters, but they're provided for in the architecture. They won't break in future Bento Search releases. It's another form of extension point. These extension points are the second half of simple things simple, complex things possible. They're sort of the complex things being made possible. Planning for them is part of understanding your developer use cases and designing an architecture that can easily handle them. Ideally, it takes no extra layers of abstraction to handle these extension points, 
you're just having your users use exactly the same architectural join points that the out-of-the-box code is using. They're just supplying custom components. So here's an example of how these things worked out in practice with Traject pretty well, I think. Stanford ended up writing a package of extensions to Traject called Traject Plus to take care of some features they needed that Traject didn't provide. The commit history suggests it was written in 2017, which was Traject 2.0 days. I can't recall, but I guess they approached me with change requests to Traject at that time, and I put them off because I couldn't figure out how to fit them in parsimoniously, or I just didn't have time to figure it out. So they went ahead and wrote their own thing, and the fact that they were able to extend Traject in this way, I consider uh, a validation of Traject's architecture, that they could make it do what they needed without much coordination with the maintainers. And I think it's used in many projects beyond Stanford. Much of the 3.0 release of Traject was backporting some features that Traject Plus had implemented, including out-of-the-box support for XML sources. But I didn't always do them with the same implementation or the same API as Traject Plus. This is another example of sort of a rewrite, you being able to have a second go at it to figure out how to do something more parsimoniously. Uh, sometimes figuring out, I was able to figure out small changes to Traject's architecture to support lots of flexibility in the right dimensions. When Traject 3.0 came out, the Traject Plus users uh, and projects using it didn't necessarily want to go retrofit all their code to the new Traject 3.0 way of doing it. But in fact, Traject Plus kept working with the Traject 3.0 with few or possibly no changes, uh, able to keep doing things the old way. I think that was huge validation of Traject's backwards compatibility um, and minimization of maintenance work as it goes forward, even adding new features and architectural changes. So as I think about these things philosophically, one of my takeaways is that software engineering is still a craft and software design is a serious thing to be studied and engaged in, especially for shared libraries rather than local apps only used by one institution. It's not always, you know, working on software design, we often hear dismissed as bike shedding, but it shouldn't really always be dismissed that way. It's, it's worth it to take time to think about the design, uh, to reflect self-reflectively uh, with your peers, do peer review, instead of just rushing to put out fires or deliver features. Um, if we can make space for this in our practice, it will reduce maintenance costs and increase values over the long term. I also want to just briefly plug a project called Kythe, which is a project of mine which tries to be guided by these design goals to create a small focused toolkit for building digital collections applications in Rails. So if that's interesting to you, check it out. Um, I could talk about this easily for another 20 minutes, but we're out of time. I'm always happy to talk more. This last slide has some sources mentioned in the talk. Thanks so much for your time. Bye. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for that presentation. That was great. Um, so uh, moving uh, uh, really quick, because I'm sure I'm probably loud. If you adjusted your volume, please readjust your volume before the next presentation. Um, we will be staying, as always, we'll be staying in this virtual meeting for our, our last talk of the session. Um, please be sure to transition to the next session in Whova so you can participate in chat, the Q&A and such. Um, if you're joining in Whova, you will need to reselect join in Whova for the next session listing. Again, we do recommend you join in Zoom because of this, how involved uh, that uh, joining in Whova process is. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available at a later date on the Code for Lib uh, YouTube channel. So our next presentation is an LIS's student's intro to open source frictionless data tools. And this will be presented by Sam Willerat. Uh, Sam is a MLS student at the San Jose State University. Uh, and uh, Sam is a frictionless data uh, for Reproducible Research Fellow at the Open Knowledge Foundation. Hi, my name is Sam Willerat. Thank you for attending my talk today titled An LIS Student's Intro to Open Source Frictionless Data Tools. So to give you some context, I am a Frictionless Fellow for Reproducible Research at the Open Knowledge Foundation. The Open Knowledge Foundation's mission is to create a fair, free, and open future for us all. They build communities, tools, and skills to promote open science in various ways. 
Um, and as a fellow, I'm a part of their frictionless data community. Their frictionless data community centers around their frictionless data project, which is an open source project focused on opening up research data and making that data more reproducible. Specifically, it focuses on data cleaning steps, which you all know are the steps you need to make to make your data usable. And the fellowship uh, that I'm a part of is a nine month long paid fellowship. Um, it is made up of early career researchers and the aim of this fellowship is to teach us how to use the frictionless tools and specifications made by the Open Knowledge Foundation. We code, we write blogs, we have open science discussions, uh, we help build up the frictionless data community, and we advocate for open science best practices for data sharing and data management. I happen to be the first LAS student to be a frictionless data fellow, and I'm here to encourage more to join. So my objectives today for this short talk are to introduce the frictionless data tools to you all, which include the data package creator and good tables, and then also to encourage other early career researchers and LAS students to consider joining the fellowship. So let's jump into those tools. The first tool I would like to share with you is called data package creator. So let's step back and talk about what a data package is. Um, that's a format that allows you to place all your data in one place before sharing it. So it's also known as the container. Um, we can use the analogy of a grocery bag. So the data package is like your grocery bag that you leave the grocery store with. It's holding all the things for you. So different types of groceries and information about your groceries uh, housed on a receipt. So typically a package has your raw data, maybe in the form of a CSV, your metadata and your schema, which is, includes the structure of your data. So why do we encourage people to use data packages? Well, they're easier to transport and reuse. Um, uh, it reduces friction in a data workflow. Um, you can include a license, such as a Creative Commons license in the package so that others know how to properly cite your work. Um, and then the data package just allows others to easily use your data. So through the fellowship, I learned how to use the data package creator primarily as a web browser tool, um, but there are other options for programmatic interfaces such as Python or R to for the data package creator. And those could be used to include this data packaging process in your pre-existing workflow. The output created by the data package creator is a JSON file, which is machine readable and interoperable. So now I'd like to show you a screenshot of the data package creator. So you'll see that the data package creator has three main panes, and this is the web interface. Um, so the first pane on the left has the upload button, the validate button, and the download button. Um, and below that is, in, is a space to put all of your metadata related to your data. Um, the validate button checks to make sure that all of your metadata is correct once you're filling out your, when you're filling out your package. And then the download button is how you actually get that JSON file. Now the second pane in the middle is the biggest pane called the resource pane. So you can see at the top, you can upload a file or use a file path. Um, I used a file path and you need to make sure to use your raw file pathway if you are using GitHub. Um, and then each box on that resources pane is a column from your data set. So you can see I can enter titles, descriptions, I can specify the data type for each column. And then the data package creator takes the column headers from your file and autofills each um, title. So the third pane I forgot to talk about is the preview pane. So on the right hand side, you can see a very small preview of what that JSON file actually looks like as you're adding in your metadata to your data package. Okay, so that was a very brief intro to the data package creator. 
The second tool I would like to share with you is called Good Tables. So we've discussed very briefly how to use the data package creator to fill up that grocery bag with your data and then your associated metadata and describing each column within your um, data pack or your data file. So the second tool I'd like to share with you is called goodtables.io. This tool is used to check the validity of the container. So if we're gonna continue with my grocery bag analogy, this tool checks to see if any of the groceries within a grocery bag that you're given or that you're planning to hand to someone uh, has any groceries in it that are leaking or if there's accidentally some duplicates or so there's some missing information within the grocery bag. So in other words, this Good Tables tool is validating our data. So it can be used for um, one-time validation, which I'll show you in a minute, or continuous validation for tabular data. So you can do a quick check um, and just take a quick snapshot in time of your data, or you can continuously validate. Um, and options for that include a Python library, a command line tool, and a web tool. So I'm gonna show you the web tool today, but just know there are other options. Um, why should you validate your data and your data package? Um, consider it your data spell check. So just like with a Word document, you would never send someone a manuscript without using spell check. Your data set should be checked for errors just the same way written work should be checked for errors. Also, it helps preserve data integrity and helps you abide by fair use principles. So quickly, I just wanted to show you a screenshot of the web tool for good tables. Um, so it runs a structural check and a content check. For example, it can find empty rows, blank headers, um, and then it comp compares your data type listed against the schema you provide it. Um, as you can see from my screenshot, there's a spot on the web tool to upload the tabular data as well as schema. In this case, I just uploaded the file path to do a quick check uh, one-time validation for my data. And I intentionally included an error to show you how the Good Tables tool can save you time by spotting errors in your data for you. So lastly, before I close, I wanted to share a few words about why you should consider applying to the Reproducible Research Fellows Program if you're an early career researcher or an LIS student. So benefits include joining a global network of individuals dedicated to open science, um, it gives you practice working with other early career researchers who have an interest in open science. You get to partner with a diverse group of individuals from various backgrounds, and you get to practice using technical tools such as GitHub. Uh, lastly, I wanted to thank you for your time today and your interest in the Frictionless Data Toolkit and the fellowship. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much for that presentation, Sam. Sam is also available to be hired. Just gonna plug that in there while I can. Um, before we break for the breakout sessions, um, please know that our community support volunteers for the second half of today are Wayne Graham, who's available under Slack as Wayne, and Jeremy Friesen uh, on Slack as Jeremy Friesen, all in word. Um, the breakout sessions will start in a moment. Uh, uh, that is uh, 2.20 p.m. Eastern, 11.20 a.m. Pacific, uh, and it will continue until 2.55 p.m. Eastern and 11.55 Pacific. Um, you will see, if you're going, what breakout session, Mary? There's three breakout sessions, and they're listed under the breakout session umbrella title in the agenda. So if you go to your agenda uh, in Whova, full agenda, um, you can click on the breakout session. Um, when you click to view session, um, you'll be able to see that this session has three subsessions. Uh, select the breakout that you want to attend and uh, select view details. From there, you can select view live stream to join the breakout. Um, please note, there may be limited capacity in the breakout rooms. We've had really wonderful attendance during this conference and I think we're gonna be testing Whova at their capacity, we'll find out. Um, again, we only have three breakouts today. People are welcome and encouraged to add more. 
Um, you are able to create a virtual meetup in Whova by going to the community tab listed on the left side of the screen in main navigation. Uh, from there, you can select uh, meetups and virtual greets. It should be pinned to the top of the list. Um, and from there, you should be able to suggest a meet, then select virtual meet, then select post, and then you're able to enter your session information and timing and submit. So uh, we will be reconvening virtually back here at 3 p.m. Eastern noon Pacific for our next set of presenters. So uh, we shall talk to y'all later. Thank you so much.